Right, so conference summary, here we go. What have we learned? Uh, right. Okay, all right, great. Uh, well, firstly, thanks to everybody for inviting me and everyone else here. It's been a wonderful meeting, and I've learned a huge amount, which may tell you more about my inattention of the past years, and so certainly that will be demonstrated in the um, upcoming attempt at summarizing. Um, the, um, the subject, is, and it keeps on, it never gets away from it, is intensely uh, taxonomic, shall we say. And of course, the categorization keeps on changing from one year to the next, and the acronyms keep on changing, and it's very hard to keep track of it. But one thing that has not changed is one of the earliest um, uh, divisions or classifications of the world, which is the Fanneroff and Riley classification. And uh, I mean, people have already said a lot about it already. And I just to point out, this is a rather short and snappy, um, in the polite West sense, um, five, uh, five page uh, article that makes a profound point and in spite of everyone expecting it to be ephemeral, we've got larger samples and the rest of it, I see absolutely no reason to, um, to look at it in any different way. They made a very simple point. It's remarkable, and it cries out for a physical explanation. A lot of what we're doing is there, and it's really been durable. And attempts to sort of elaborate and so on have less, less good than the original version. So this is uh, Bernie, who I uh, obviously knew as a fellow graduate student somewhat, and uh, uh, well, Julia Riley, who I knew somewhat earlier and somewhat better um, at that time, and she's in, I'm sad that she couldn't be here because uh, I think she, she would have enjoyed this meeting, but uh, at any rate, it was a, it was a, a, a very fine paper and uh, with a, a lot to um, add to it. Now, uh, as we uh, go on, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't want to go back, didn't want to go back one yet. My hand slipped. Okay, um, so uh, as we go on, there's obviously been many other things that we've learned on the way, and you heard a bit of that, that's from Tony Reader this morning. Uh, the, we've had many talks here. I, I should say, I've, this has been very hastily put together, almost in real time, and many uh, pictures are missing from this presentation, and many names are missing from this presentation, and some of them put in the wrong place. Part of my problem was all of yesterday. I thought all of yesterday. I couldn't get into hold of yesterday's slides, and today's I was handling with with an iPhone, but um, which was not totally satisfactory. So I missed out a lot of yesterday's uh, uh, talks. But at any rate, um, so some of the, some of these attributions are notional, but certainly uh, Prajwal gave us a very nice talk about uh, blazars, and this was a very important uh, that a to understand that. You know, the, the, the subset of jet of uh, AGN with relativistic jets that were beamed towards us were going to be vastly overrepresented in, sam in, in complete samples. Uh, we call those blazars, and those have been split up nowadays into uh, the lower pad BL lack objects that don't have um, emission, bright, bright emission lights. And they certainly, contrary to something that was said, or may have misunderstood, certainly don't have quasars sitting underneath them because the quasars are extremely brute, luminous and they don't have these emission lines, although they can exhibit them some of the time. And that's, that's important, and I'll return to that point. And then there's the brighter version of this, the flat spectrum radio quasars, and they've had other names over the years. Um, and they seem to be um, sort of similar in their properties and also distinctly different. Something we've heard here, and I was very impressed by this, this talk, was, you know, it used to be a thing we say that, you know, the radio sources are associated with elliptical galaxies and, and, and the spirals don't exhibit them, but we know that spirals can be radio sources, they're not radio silent, uh, but they can also exhibit jets, as we saw rather nicely uh, from the uh, work, and it was very nice to see GMRT um, uh, contributing in this very special way and seeing these very rare spiral jets and sort of cry, again crying out for an explanation and we heard many good speculations there and, and there's a very happy um, uh, uh, godfather of GMRT um, uh, seeing these results. So um, the, the other sort of type of jet, and it consciously was uh, underemphasized this meeting, are the ones associated with molecular galactic objects, the gamma ray bursts, the pulsars, the protostars, and so on. There's certainly jets, there are more of them, of course. Uh, uh, and there are lessons to be learned from and to those classes of objects, as we saw particularly this morning. 
um, uh, in, in the SS433. Um, I'm going to take, um, I don't have a, a picture of it. I couldn't get one of that, so let me sketch it for you. Um, it sort of get, looks a bit like that, I think. And then there's a three there like that, and a three there like that, and, and then there's a, if I get right, uh, there's a sort of four there like that. And um, so, uh, so I, I couldn't get the proper image, but it looks pretty much like that. Um, um, I, I, I was told that jerk joke translates into Urdu, uh, but I'm not into <laughs> if I did that on my side, but anyway. Um, uh, anyway, so um, the, uh, but these are really quasars for the impatient, and the extent it's just a scaling with mass. We can learn a huge amount about the long-term evolution of, qua of quasars by looking at the micro, micro quasars. And, and in fact, in, in, in the information paper go the other way. And this is important. And then we saw SIG X3. We saw the uh, sort of ev evidence presented there for precession. And there are other sources, of course, that do this. Some, some especially with different classes of objects. And then the SIG A, we said, and we saw some discussion of the possibility that was a precessing source. And then there's also uh, the binary black holes, uh, uh, which have been in, in, invoked. And, um, and again, uh, this is where there's, you know, there have been three or four recent claims in the literature over the past year that we discovered binary black holes uh, in, in, in active galactic nuclei. And uh, the other, one of the alternative possibilities, uh, well, two alternative possibilities, one that is just red noise, and we should, that's real, real and present danger. Keeps, certainly keeps, that's the sort of noise that keeps me awake at night. But uh, another one is that you're looking at a quasi-periodic oscillation, which, of course, is a well-known phenomenon. This scales with a 10... You know, 10 hertz quasi periodic oscillation associated with uh, an agent. So you clearly need much more data in order to be really sign off on the fact that you're seeing a binary black hole. But the, you know, the scaling with the microquasars is, is uh, obviously a very good way to do this. Um, uh, another sort of classification which has been here, and I, and I don't know, I have to ask our chair whether it's a lurg or a leg, and I uh, know it'll be something different next meeting, but, uh, but we all know what it means, and that at least the general thought has been there for a long time, the, the excitation, the high excitation lines. And then something came up this morning, which, you know, I mean, it's sort of blindly obvious, and I think everybody knows this, that when we look at, you know, you can say that it's the, part of the orient, uh, the unification sort of story was, well, we didn't see the broad lines because there was a great big dusty torus in the way. And so, but if we're looking at the blazars and we're looking at the BLAC objects in particular, we're not seeing the, the broad emission lines either. So there's more to it than that. And that came up this morning in the, in the talk. Um, and then uh, there's radio loud versus radio quiet. And we've been, that's a, a dying distinction from the, from, uh, uh, from Robert Lang. Um, and it's all part of the sort of general sort of unification. Uh, uh, and I remind you, this is a, actually a church, and it's a very religious matter, this unification business. And, and for the physicists, there's a couple of physicists who've heard in here, we actually have a sort of larger scheme, which is called grand unification, but it has been less successful than unification. Um, but we're working on it. Um, okay, uh, part of this is, and I think, you know, going back to the FR classification, and they, of course, didn't call it this, as you will see here. They didn't say the Fanner of Riley classification. I think, I think it was Malcolm Longer, wasn't it, who sort of proselytized that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he certainly deserves it. And, uh, but um, one sort of possibility is that we have two types of wind, one that derives from the spinning black hole and the other derives from the associated accretion disk. And this is, you know, perhaps magnetic, perhaps driven by radiation, uh, or in some cases even driven by hot gas, but, uh, and there have been various schemes for doing that. Um, and then in the, you know, the FR2s, the momentum carried by the relativistic jet drags along the wind, the, the, the disk wind, and in the um, uh, FR1s, it's the other way around. And so that could, that could, could be pride, that's one of several possible rationalizations of this uh, so-called dichotomy. Okay, um, so uh, inspired by Rodrigo Reeves' um, slide, uh, if we just look at the broadest brush, we forget about that, forget about that little dip there, uh, and look, uh, you know, take the measure thing, you've got two humps here, and this is the sort of standard BL Lackle Blazar spectrum, 
I think, oh, wait a minute, uh, yeah. The, so uh, he produced uh, this um, and that, and, and that, I think that's the other one, the, you know, the, the form, well, formerly known as uh, radio quiet object. Um, and, uh, and so I'm proposing this as a new classification scheme for the next meeting. And, and I, I know, as a kid, I could never, you know, it's the sort of thing you learn in grade school, and I can never remember which was the Bactrian and which was the dromedary, and it occurred to me yesterday there was an easy way of remembering it. Okay. Um, so I thought, I thought uh, you may need this. You, you may have kids, you know. Um, uh, okay, so anyway, so let's get, get it back, back to this. Um, uh, the, the subject rests on a radio foundation, with, with a small um, sort of exception of uh, the first jet coming in M87 at optical wavelengths, but if you ignore that little detail, um, the, uh, um, it really grew up, and, and I, 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 you know, as it's in India, I'd really like to pay tribute to this. This was, you know, signal say that there were radio sources found in the early 50s, and, um, uh, you know, and you expect, you, 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 there's an identification with a galaxy, so you're expected to see it, you know, a blob sitting on the galaxy. And what they found, this is Jenison and M.K. Das Gupta, um, and this wasn't just, you know, going to the telescope and doing something, they built the telescope. This was, you know, this was, this was heroic business. And they, you know, and under uh, Hanbury Brown and so on. And they, you know, and the galaxy, of course, is there. And this is the first really double radio source, and it's a sort of amazing discovery. And of course, I think mean, this is sort of what I think there's better images actually, and this is not such a new image. This is brand new. This came from Tony, Tony uh, Censuses. And this is what it's become. And of course, the binarity is preserved here, but this is milli arc second structure here, right in the middle of the nucleus, looking right down towards the central black hole, 100 million solar masses worth of it. And here's a, oh, it, sorry, it's got. Cut off, I haven't done justice, sorry. Um, this is the stacked, I think, three millimeter, this is the stacked three millimeter observations, I think, isn't it? So this is exquisite VLBI, you know, as good as you get, and it's extraordinary that this technique has developed so much, and it all came from that, really, in some sense. And it's a, as you know, a long heritage of developing capabilities. It's exquisite image, and we saw countless examples of those. Um, here's M87, there are many renditions of this, including a movie, but you know, you're getting down here towards imaging comfortably on Twiddle's 100M and getting fringes on almost 10M. Uh, and then, as we know, the hope is we get down to, uh, uh, well, we'll say a little bit more about this, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope, where this will, this will happen because it will get better as you go to higher frequencies and people phase up ALMA and get better and better at doing the interferometry. It's going to happen. Where it stops is not quite clear, but it's clearly going to get a lot better than it has. And this is extraordinary to be able to look on the scale of the event horizon in M87 in the galactic center. Now, a lot of the science that's come out of the modern RMS is not at looking at the special cases. It's even more important to do the surveys, but not in the scattershot way in which necessarily the subject has been prosecuted in the past. Now we have sort of relatively well-selected surveys that are systematically observed in a sort of preordained way. And using that, you could actually start testing some and rejecting hypotheses. So this is quite good. And then also, of course, it's now, I'll say a bit more about this, this is multi-wavelength, obviously, especially gamma rays, and a lot of this is anchored to um, Hermi. So if we look uh, to optical wavelengths, I'm, I'm not doing justice to the optical contributions of this meeting, for the reason I've just given, uh, but, uh, one of them, which we saw well represented here um, in Arendt's talk, uh, was um, in the, what I would call the inactive galactic nuclei. Uh, these are the ones where there are black holes in the center, but they're like ours, for which we should be praised. We shouldn't be ashamed of this. We should be rather glad that we don't sit in the middle in the, with the quasar at the middle. Um, but uh, the, you see the non-thermal emission from often galaxies often with a lot of star formation. You see the gamma rays as well, coupled with it. So you have exquisite imaging They're here in ultraviolet. And so we're learning a lot about how galaxies on their own evolve over the course of time. And uh, we've got, um, uh, and of course radio is a part of this a lot, but it's, you know, it's sort of anchored, this part is sort of really anchored in the optical observations. And you know, one of the things that one can do is you determine how much this contributes to the backgrounds. There wasn't so much discussed here, but I think it's now pretty clear that after a brief flurry of excitement that the gamma ray background, or at least part of it, could be uh, associated with star-forming galaxies and not blazers. We're now pretty confident that that's not the case. 
Another type of survey that's uh, growing in importance, and of course is very important for non-thermal contributions, especially the jets, uh, is the optical polarimetric surveys. And again, it's the same um, business of doing a sort of systematic survey uh, where you can, instead of saying, oh, that one changed, and then the gamma rays changed at the same time, therefore they're clearly coming from the same place, you can actually test hypotheses in a rigorous way, as Tony really had emphasized this morning, must be done. And I think a lot of this subject has really been bedeviled by sort of spurious associations on the basis of not doing a statistical uh, analysis of what you've got. And again, I'll say a little bit more about that. The thing that struck me, struck me here was a, a, the paper by Hikil, where he tried to decompose some of these time surveys, I think in this case in the polarimetry, um, and asked what I think I've always thought is a very important question, was do you decompose into a sort of series of uh, sort of primitive variations, which might be what they, the x-ray sometimes just call FREDs, or fast rise exponential decays. So it's some sort of feature like that. And then there's the inverse of that, which is I would call the DERF, which is you know, an exponential rise and then a fast decay. And as I understood it, his decomposition indicated a bit of both, uh, indicated both. But um, this is the right, even though this is obviously just a preliminary uh, uh, investigation, I think it's, it's the right way to go. And this is the sort of analysis of this data this data, these data sets cry out to, to, be done, to be done because you've got really good long time series for all of these sources. You can do, ask these statistical questions. Is your data stream in a, you know, any wave band or polarimetry or whatever, um, is it rever time reversible? That's a primitive question and we ought to, ought to have a confident answer to that with the data we've got. Okay. X-ray vision. Again, this, I'm not doing justice to this for the reason I gave. Um, so we saw from them. I mean, Marshall and others, many others actually, the, uh, arc, you know, the impact of the Chandra arc second imaging. I mean, obviously we've got to learn from the other telescopes, but the arc second imaging is fantastic. Um, and, uh, whoops, sorry, uh, and, uh, and the scattering of the CMB in the old lows, we saw about that this morning. Here's um, Pictor A as it exists in the literature. And I have, I have been privileged to be shown the version of it uh, on Martin's uh, laptop, which I, is ex very exciting. And so I'm, you should look, for, you look out for that paper when it comes out. Um, so uh, again, being able to resolve across the jet. And this is, of course, dead straight in a, you know, all, all sense in applied mathematics, which this should be as unstable as anything. But it isn't. And of course, we heard, we heard from Sasha Tchaikovsky this morning. Um, uh, no, yesterday morning, I think it was, yeah. Is it? No, yesterday morning, that's right, yes. Um, so, which is why I haven't got much of his slide uh, here. Um, and uh, that, you know, there are reasons that the, this, this jet can, the, you know, essentially the relativity and the longitudinal magnetic field can give it some spine, give it some backbone, and preserve it against the instabilities that would otherwise destroy it. Um, the gamma rays, I would sort of describe as sort of volatile, uh, that, you know, they're very nervous, they're over-caffeinated or something, and so they, uh, they, they're, not all sources do this, but the most extreme blazars exhibit extraordinary variability, and we have many talks describing this. Um, the, uh, we see them obviously with Fermi, and then the atmospheric Cherenkov, and water Cherenkov detectors, and GEB and TB bands roughly exactly. There's, there's many things that have and should be said about this, but I think the simplest way of expressing this, and it came out in several of the talks, was that there's, typically there's a minimum radius, a, a sort of gamma sphere from which the gamma rays can escape. And that's simply photon-photon pair production. If you have some knowledge of what the radiation field is, and in a quasar certainly you should do, it might be a bit more conjectural in a BLAC, but in a quasar you certainly should do, then you've no, no, you are going to question the QED, and this is a, you know, you won't get the radiation out from within there. And that's a lower bound on the emission radius, and yet the, the things are varying rapidly. In, the, in this case, my, this, is the mo this is the champion, if you like, this is two minute variation, two minute variation at TV uh, energies, gamma's, you know, 10 to the 8 or so on. Um, and, uh, and you say, well, the size can't be more than CTV. Well, we all know, as we know for a long time, that you can amplify that by some kinematic factors. And we can argue what those kinematic factors are. You can just lazily throw in some gammas if you want. But I mean, you know, if you think about it, there certainly are kinematic possibilities. But they can't be, they're not likely to be too large. And yet, the disparities are enormous. Two minutes is more than the size of the black hole. Um, uh, so there's got to be dramatic acceleration. 
which you can think of as ohmic dissipation of that electromagnetic field, um, and you see the same phenomena. This is not just the jets here in AGN. You see them in you see this in in Plato and Nebula and in gamma ray bursts and so on. Um, and another uh, and this is three two two seven three gamma rays appear to be varying in some cases at ten GeV on on ten hours. So that's and yet the uh, an estimate of the um, minimum radius of emission is thirty. 30 light years. This is, this is a big disparity, and it's a lot of Lorentz factors you need to, uh, to make, that, make that occur. So this is a big puzzle. I think it's a very important puzzle. And I think it probably had rational solutions, but it, they're nice. Um, now, this is a nice plot that goes back to the point I made before about statistical surveys. This is, this is, this is a, you know, doing, taking time series and asking a simple question. Do the gamma rays come before or after the radio flux? And so there's a prejudice beforehand that they came before, and that prejudice is, is borne out now. I think I don't think anyone's going to argue with that now, where they would argue with a, an individual case and said, in this case, there was a variation before another variation. So, so what? Uh, so this is, this is statistics. So this is great. Um, uh, this is a nod to Bernie. Uh, I think it's not. Um, so... You know, we're now looking at these things throughout the electromagnetic spectrum from the low radio frequency, the highest energy gamma rays. I mean, it's, um, and it's close to what is possible. We're not going to see, see radio waves propagating the interstellar and interplanetary media at much lower frequencies, let alone the ionosphere. Um, and uh, and 100 TeV, we're approaching the point where the microwave background, which we do believe is everywhere, uh, gobbles up. Photo gamma rays on on, pair, on the same on photopion production, and so oh sorry on pair, sorry pair production excuse me, um, and and again we've had these sort of great multi wavelength campaigns as I mentioned they've somewhat been anchored by Fermi uh, I've sort of made these points uh, in the in the jets we've generally presumed and we've sort of settled on the view that most of what we observe throughout this huge range is either synchrotron radiation or inverse Compton scattering. And the inverse Compton appears to be mostly external photons to the jet in the case of the high luminosity flat spectrum radio quasars and internal in the case of the BLX, that's the sort of gamma ray perspective. Um, and, uh, but we should not forget that there are alternative scenarios that have never been fully ruled out, including hadronic models, uh, thermal bremsstrahlung, and so on and so forth. And we, you know, whereas I have no good reason for doubting any of this, I think there's work to be done to produce firmer exclusions of those alternatives in, in most cases. Uh, there's a, we heard several times here there's a problem with using the CMB, scouting inverse Compton, because it, there's a deficit in the gamma rays. And, what, what that sort of cried out to me is to look for Klein Nishina suppression here and then sort of reverse engineer this to try and figure out what, what the particles were and so on. And we heard a talk this morning about Sahai Yanathan, um, uh, Sahai Yanathan uh, which was you know, dis describing and discussing this. And I think, again, there's sort of more work to be done there, but clearly a lot of progress. Um, 3C273, this is the jet. This is just, you know, just seeing what the... You know, this is BLA, Spitzer, Hubble, Chandra. You know, this is, this is happening all the time, and it's very different from being spectrally chauvinist and just seeing, just making your, your one map. And this, is, this is the way to do the science, obviously. Um, now, uh, I hope I got transcribed this correctly. I hold a lot of people talking about whole jet disconnections. And, uh, uh, and, I, um, and so this is being anchored in the wonderful simulations that Sasha and, and Jonathan McKinney and many others, David Meyer, who I'd hoped also would be here, um, uh, and other, other pioneers have done here. And um, I think that uh, this has really transformed the theory, never mind the observations, because from the one hand, this is... Um, remove some genuine and well thought through doubts about how magnetic fields beha behave in curved space times by demonstrating sort of explicitly that things evolve in the way that they were suspected to do. Um, but also it has pointed the way to new phenomena I, and things that could have been thought through sort of, so, sort of semi-analytically beforehand and in fact weren't and it wasn't until you performed the numerical experiment that you saw something, and this has happened several times in this business, 
including the sort of wiggling jets and so on, which sort of produce hula hoop type oscillations, the extent to which those have a high Q, but that's an M equals one instability in an accretion disk, and that's after the fact, but nobody thought of that beforehand. You do the, do the calculation, it at least gets you started thinking about it, and then you can go through and say, well, how, how good an oscillation is this? And could you see this in the observations? This is the thing you could, in principle, see in the observations. And so I think this is very exciting, and so, but the other, you know, the other uh, thing is it's, we are big conclusions here. It's demonstrated that, that extracting energy from the black hole can be efficient in two ways. It can be efficient in terms of taking energy out of the spin of the black hole and not uh, dissipating most of it within the event horizon, which was certainly a possibility that could happen. But it's also efficient in the sense of getting the power out relative to the mass supply rate. And in both of those ways, it's efficient. And that obviously makes it promising as an explanation. The thick disks appear to be essential for getting the high efficiency. Um, may not have worked through that all of that as much as is necessary, but it certainly is strongly indicated by simulations that now many people have done. And the but the thin disks also make jets, but less powerful ones. And the recent paper I read uh, demonstrated that. Obviously, this leads. Um, now, this is theory. This is one thing, a prop from Chris Reynolds. I can't remember who showed it, somebody showed it. And uh, so you'd say, well, the big powerful radio galaxies would have wacky spinning black holes and everything else would be, and it doesn't seem, you know, on a sample of two, um, which may not be quite enough, um, uh, using a, you know, a technique of the iron line widths and so on that may be a little subject to uh, uh, discussion. Um, this is a, uh, uh, not, not, not encouraging, shall we say. And so, you know, obviously people have got to, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get better observations. I mean, uh, Astro H will be launched next year. And people can do reverberation mapping. They will learn about the, the geometry of the X-ray uh, emission, you know, it, what the lamp, I talked a little bit yesterday about the lamppost, but what that lamppost actually is. Um, they'll see if that really is a correct description and we'll learn a lot about what goes on around it. These, these telescopes and we'll maybe get better or more, certainly more measurements of the, of the angular frequency of the, of the black hole. This also can produce, a, this wiggling can produce a measurement of that too in principle. Um, the Event Horizon Telescope, sorry, is, you know, is the next thing to happen and this is a tremendously exciting business. I've already mentioned this, it's going to be very good, isn't it? but um, you know, it's definition to be, it's going to be, it's not a binary experiment, it's just getting better and better and better and already it's a success, but it, you know, how far can this go until you, until you run out of limitations? Um, you run into limitations, but it is, um, uh, and we heard this morning how adding extra baselines, but perhaps to South Africa, perhaps even to India maybe, um, with a giant dish could make a, a huge difference to the imaging that you could do. And that, that, it'd be lovely to see that happen. It's un quite unnecessary to do the experiment because uh, here's a simulation done by my erstwhile graduate student, Avery Broderick, and so uh, there's the answer. So it can't possibly be any different from that. Okay, um, so uh, the fueling of jets. Uh, there are many things that were discussed here, and some in the context of these mad simulations. I think I've, sorry, uh, the, the first thing, of course, just to repeat, everybody knows this now, it, it, the magnetorotational instability is so virulent, it's a victim of its own success, and is replaced by highly nonlinear things, but there's no alternative to having highly magnetized disks. Beyond that, we're still not entirely sure what the geometries are, whether they're dipolar or quadrupolar, and so on. Um, we know observationally, here's the M87, which was shown, I can't remember who showed it, but this is Peter's work, and, and then it's very a bit, a bit what comes in the disk, but it's tiny compared with what what the supposed power in the jet is. This is the jet polymetric luminosity, but this is, it's tiny compared with that. So there are circumstances where you're getting far, efficiencies far higher than even Sasha has claimed. Um, and, you know, this, this in the back of the center might be another case, and we certainly um, have to deal with that. Now, one of the things that um, appears to be happening, I, I would say, if you look at what the mass supply rate in these you know, Amity and the Glacier Center do a case, there's many, many more of them. Typically, it's orders of magnitude greater than the mass accretion rate, and I distinguish those two quantities. And the apparent mass accretion rate, I should say. And then there are 
you know, it's not, a, it's not a question of who said what or anything like that, but I think it, there are two essentially different physical things that can happen here. Either essentially all of the supplied mass goes into the black hole, essentially adiabatically and non-radiatively. That's one possibility. And the other possibility is that the torques that inevitably ha exist in the accretion disk, any generalized torque, presumably magnetic, that drives the gas inwards, does work on the outside gas, and that transport of energy outwards unbinds the gas and drives the wind. How the wind is, is, operates is unknown. We don't, this is a dirty secret, we don't understand the solar wind, and we've spent enough money and time and effort and thought trying to understand that, and we still don't really understand what drives the solar wind. Why is it 10 to the minus 14 solar masses a year, not 10 to the minus 30? We've got lots of good theories, and certainly lots of observations. So, you know, we don't really know how a wind from a disk goes, but I think in sort of, we do know that we've got to get rid of that energy one way, and this is a very appealing channel. And it won't just come out from, from, a, from a simulation. It's going to require much more intricate physics to understand how much the outflow is there. There's been a lot of heroic attempts to do this, uh, but it hasn't happened. And nothing, is convinced, not, nothing that we can really sign off on yet. Um, the lines, you know, the legs and the heads and so on. Um, there are the big and the little tori. There may be a little torus associated with forming the jet, and then a big, great big torus much further out that may have a magical occulting process. The one in the middle sort of has some physical sense. The one on the outside, which is sort of, you know, kind of matter, I think, has always had big problems because you've got this great big thick torus. And, it, and as uh, my friend and colleague George Rybicki used to say, supported by the power of pure thought, that was not obvious why it was so, stayed so puffed up like that. And the, um, you know, what provided the effective pressure there. And the, um, the alternative to this, which again is, this is an observational, ought to be an observational matter, is that it's not, a, it's a thin dish, but it's warped, you know, for various reasons, maybe instabilities or maybe vagaries in the mass supply, it's something like that. And it had the same sort of occulting properties and less physical challenge. So again, this is something that ought to be sorted out observationally. The rolling, whoops, the rolling standards correlation, I think everyone knows what that is. Not quite sure we understand how to put that into context. There's certainly a straight line on an observation of two measured quantities. Uh, but how do we put that in the context? We don't know. And then something that I think was actually sort of hinted at by several people, but this morning by Catherine, as the, the accretion, these accretion limit cycles, we expect them. Does the dwarf novi do this? You know, the dwarf novi outburst. They have um, special limit cycles, and we have physical reasons for those to happen associated with the opacity in the accretion disk. That's not, not going to happen here. It's a completely different regime, but something analogous to that could happen. And so there could be these special limit cycles that happen, and they lead to mode changing. And as Catherine said, sometimes SS433 looks really rather bright and luminous, and sometimes it's rather faint. And that's, if we look at a sample of quasars with these much longer time scales between modes, maybe eight orders of magnitude longer in time scale, then it could be that there's nothing sort of special about the spin of the black hole or indeed the environment of the galaxy, it could just be there are limit cycles are going and they will see on timescales, they can't be too short, obviously, but on timescales that are sort of modestly long, perhaps longer than the time it takes a jet to get from to the business end of a hotspot, um, the, uh, uh, the, um, there'll be mode changing and that's, you know, this is part of the explanation for the differences between um, quasars whose um, descriptors can no longer be named. And um, another thing we learned from our chair was that this slightly appealing picture that it was just simply Bondi accretion that made the jets is now, with a larger sample and more thought and examination, is not holding up terribly well. And uh, that was, again, the thing I learned here and had not been aware of before. So um, if we now look at jets as fluids, which the way most people will do this, I'll just think of them as fluids, magnetized or not. Um, the, the first thing is superluminal expansion. Um, one of the things that Tony was too modest not to say this morning was this was a pretty important step along the way because this is, I think it was, was it 10, it's from 77 to 79. I, I le I've left off here the scale, but this is 10C. And you know, this wasn't a marginal thing. This was, this was a feature moving clearly at 10C. And that sort of uh, 
again, persuaded skeptics that this was real. Um, and we now know that for the, the quasars and the, and the radio galaxies and so on, we're looking at between roughly about 1 and 30 C in apparent speeds. The, um, the GRBs, I remind you, allegedly go up to 1,000 C. That is really, really remarkable. And if it's anything similar to this, it, again, we ought to understand why it's different there, um, or whether there's something wrong with the argument that leads to that estimate. Uh, the kinematics, we have many people talk about this. I saw really, a, for me, was an accumulation of evidence uh, that there's, um, you know, spines and sheaths. This is a perfectly reasonable thing. This, you know, it's a, it's a shear flow and you'd expect it to be faster at the middle and slower at the sides. This is perfectly reasonable. And you call it a spine and sheath or whatever you want to call it. But it's, you know, so I said more and more evidence for that. Uh, here, acceleration and deceleration. You'd expect these things to be accelerated and then to be decelerated. Again, evidence for this in certain cases. Much more of this is going to happen in the future. The collimation of these, um, the, you know, those simulations have been gas dynamical and have basically looked at basically gas dynamical processes like these recollimation shocks and so on. And there are also ones that are associated with hoop stress that have, that wrap around the jet and they can do just the same sort of collimation there. Getting there. Okay, great. Um, now, the relativistic bins, bends we heard this morning, Singal and so on, there's a lot of discussion about that. And I'd like to go back to 3C31. I was a little bit surprised by, uh, I said, I, uh, 3C31 was this, sorry, I thought I had a picture of it here, but it's vanished. Okay, um, but um, this is, remember, you know, sort of C-type radio source that has sort of shape like that. And I just remind you that it ha there's a galaxy 11 kiloparsecs away, there's a third of the mass of the presumably, of the, um, of the galaxy that makes the jets. And, you know, it's not unreasonable um, that it be in some sort of orbit, and then what you're doing is you're looking at something sh shaking the garden like that, sh like the garden hose sort of watering the garden, sort of doing that and seeing some sort of shape like that. And, in fact, you can make little models like that and so on. And then I was reminded of that when I just saw this um, bit of sky writing from, uh, from GMRT, which I kind of given this this picture, and I think this is known as the Omega Jet because this feature here is, is a capital Omega. Actually, if you, you can't see it. If you look in here, it says it equals 0.3 if you read a little bit further. But, um, uh, but this, is, this, is, you know, this is a great thing to see, and, and you can do kinematics with these things. I don't know if this has a companion galaxy or that. I think maybe you, maybe you, you know. But, um, but that would be an interesting thing. You know, it could be just an autonomous, as Sasha said this morning, it could just be an autonomous instability that happens at more or less the same place on both sides, or it could be something associated with the source. It could be like a procession. In this case, it could be a procession or it could be a jog. Uh, you'd have to think about it a little bit more. But, you know, modeling the, mod these things. And the other thing is the old way of doing this was just purely ballistic, like it appears to be appropriate for SS43. But in this case, it's probably almost certainly gas dynamical. And you have to do gas dynamics to think about these. So orbiting jets, so there's processing jets and uh, Hydra A. We had a sort of very nice discussion of that this morning from NOAA's. Okay, um, so what happens to magnetic field? Well, of course, anything in principle, if you, the less you know, the more freedom you have to um, do this. We've got to make a magnetic field, go from a Tesla to a nanotesla. Um, the simple thing to say is the parallel components to scale as A minus one, so it isn't long before it should be, you know, you could, the flux should be, should it, the parallel component, but it can reverse many times along the line of sight. As, as was discussed yesterday, and then the, but the perpendicular component, if the current is conserved, should be go down as one over the width of the jet, if the current is conserved. Now, so the big debate in some sense can be cast in a slightly different way, the way an electrical engineer might do it, is do the currents in the one extreme case go all the way out to the hot spot and then close and then go in some giant intergalactic loop and back into the <coughs> nucleus, or do in the other extreme, do they close very close? Um, to the black hole, say with 100M or something like that, and, and then you'll made the world safe for gas dynamics. Um, and, uh, and I just sort of make one quick physics point here is that when currents do, do close eventually, they can do in two ways. They can do either dissipatively, or prodigally as I call it, or they can do what I call industriously by doing J cross B work. One is sort of, one is creates entropy, the other doesn't. And one, one is visible and the other is invisible essentially. And, you know, the, you know we, we've, we can't just ask whether the currents close, we should ask how they close, and that's, that's important. Okay, the core shifts, that was a very nice discussion by Heine and others. Um, 
And the, you know, the observations look good. I mean, I'm not an expert on interpreting them. The models I can testify are, are, were pretty simplistic. And I think we, you can ensure in verse, if we've got really good observations, we do a lot more work on them, then we should be learning something more about how the, the profile of the jet it goes up and this parallel to perpendicular transition and so on. Um, uh, so let me speed up very quickly here. Um, uh, we had a lot of discussion, of course, about the disk polarity and the Faraday rotation. That you can then use that to determine whether the field geometry is dipolar or quadrupolar. Um, the, the presumption is that it's dipolar. It would be nice to verify that produces a sort of BMW type pattern of, uh, in the Faraday rotation, whereas the other would produce the opposite pattern. And if we can see a two sided jet and get that right, then that should be pretty clear. Um, and then this business about which Martin brought, brought up a lot of, uh, was the, you know, I don't believe any of this magnetic collimation because, you know, where it's pressure, dom it's gas pressure dominated, it's, it's, you know, particle pressure dominated, not magnetic dominated. But actually, there's a resolution of that. Is if you think about how the pinch effect works, it's pressure in the middle. So the bit you see is actually a high beta. And the invisible bit around the outside that's sort of hugging it and, provide, and providing the hoop stress. That's, that's pretty much invisible, and that's low beta. And I think there's a record, uh, you know, reconciliation. That, of course, enables you to have a very overpressured jet with, with, uh, over to the, um, compared with the uh, environment. So there's a sort of basic, now, the, in the particle acceleration, let me again go very quickly through this. Um, there's basic sort of relativistic jet scenario that says you start off with a high sigma outflow magnetically dominated close to the black hole, and then at the end of the jet it's probably much different from that. And I'm going to try and hurry up here. Um, so relativistic particles and photons. Um, uh, there are clearly many acceleration processes, not all of them which were represented here. Jets are noisy. Anybody lives now in an airport, the jets are noisy. And, you know, there's a lot of turbulence there, and they will accelerate particles. And for a lot of waves, you don't, for a lot of emission, you don't need rapid acceleration. It can do just fine with second order Fermi acceleration. Shocks can do it. I didn't hear Revels talk yesterday, so I, I'm very sad about that. So, but, you know, they, they, we know that they're efficient and they amplify magnetic field non-relativistically. I, I, for one, remain to be persuaded they can be efficient at high, energy, at high energies at, when they're extremely relativistic. But I think there are forms of shocks, again, I'm not saying about this, that could do the job of making the most dramatic gamma ray variation. The other form of ray connection that's very popular, and rightly so, is reconnection, which is notoriously inefficient, run relativistically, but could be perfect non relativistically for making lots of uh, fast particle acceleration. And you get little regions where E is greater than B and so on, which is what you need to make a great acceleration. Let me not say any more. Uh, and I mentioned briefly yesterday about, of course, you won't say more about this. But again, I think one of the things, this is Havata uh, and so on, these VLBI spectral index maps. And this is just a little bit of a whole lot of data. There's a huge amount of data there. I suspect we ought to be getting some answers to what's going on by you know, contrasting this with models and so on. So the environmental impact, we had that this morning. Um, uh, this afternoon, excuse me, sorry. Um, you know, the serious heating of the intercluster medium here, um, slushing, uh, turbulence, internal waves, all of these. We don't know how it happens, but there was a lot of good discussion here this afternoon. And then there's this mystery cooling when the gas appears to vanish in frequency space, in, in X-ray energy space. That's again, is um, uh, still, still, I believe, a puzzle, uh, but we had a good discussions of that. Clearly, there are fee it's not just a question of a one-off thing. It's a, it's a cycle. We've got an, in, in, we've got an ecology here, and we've got a cycle of gas falling in and going out, two modes of accretion, as we saw, the clusters and the uh, disks, and it triggers nuclear activity, and a typical galaxy may well be active, highly active many times over its lifetime to date. Big implications for galaxy evolution. The AGN is now accepted by most of the people who work in this business as not a sideshow, and it can moderate the luminosity function the way we heard discussed nicely. ALMA is going to make a huge difference, not just to the outflow, but also to the inflow. Gas has got to get into the nucleus. ALMA may find the molecular gas falling in as much as it finds it moving out. The simulations that go along with this are, are great now. They've got, they've got a long way to go, but they're much better than they were because they're now wet. They've now got lots of the gas and the gas dynamics, and they're starting to confront the real physical meaning they deal with. And as we just heard in the very last talk, dust is there. And dust is always a problem in astrophysics, but it's also contributing to the physics of what's going on. So um, uh, I think it's a bit, bit, bit whimsical, this. This is, um, you may know Professor 
the, the question was how much, what, what has this got to do with cosmology? Radio astronomy has a distinguished history of contributing to cosmology. And we should be proud of it. Uh, but how much does this jet business have to do uh, with cosmology today? And this is Professor Pangloss um, Voltaire's Candide, and he was a professor of this. Um, which uh, it was a satire of Leibniz, I think. But it's uh, um, and so the question is, what does all this can do for cosmology and the meaning of life and everything else? And um, and I think already we're seeing positively through the EBR, we've completely revised the view of the house galaxies fill the intergalactic medium with photons considerably, simply by using quantum electrodynamics and observations of blazars. And that's still going on, and that seems to be about stabilizing now. The, a tougher cell is the primordial magnetic field, and, but that's a work in progress, but I think it can be there. But also it impacts this negatively, because those who believe, many some cosmologists believe that any galaxy is, is distinguished by a mass and a spin, and that's it, and it's sort of like an elementary particle, whereas we know it's more like people, and there's a sort of associate, everyone is different, and there's a sociology and history and all the rest of it associated with them. And, and it wouldn't matter if it weren't for the fact that these AGN and so on are making huge impacts on the galaxy formation and evolution, and the same for the clusters. But possibly, it's possible that there may be, if we find extra galactic SS4 degrees and so on, that we can do some kinematics there, which would make this a nice, genuine metrical test for cosmology. And the other way in which this may, oh, radius was going to know this is going to happen, is as sources for, um, uh, for epoch of ionization studies. So I'd like to finish in a sort of slightly whimsical, another whimsical way. This is a, uh, a source. It actually has another name. Is it, is it, some, some, some of the older people here must, would know what it is. It's EA 102, yes. And, I, and the time when Bernie and, and Julia and others were undergraduates, there was a, there it is, um, there, there was a, a, a pop song um, uh, by the, the Birds, and in 1967, um, and it was stimulated by a radio astronomer, Kardashev, um, and, the, and the idea that the variability of quasars had just been discovered, and uh, so this was, um, he didn't know it was a quasar, but he did think it was an extraterrestrial civilization, that was kind of more fun. Um, and uh, so I, don't know if I, I, I thought I'd play it, but I thought anyone over under 50 would be very suspicious. Uh, and, uh, Anybody would listen to music like that. Okay, so, so CTA went year after year receiving you, so we're still doing it, and, and signals tell us that you're there. Um, we can hear them loud and clear, which is certainly true. You can hear them in that time, you could hear them loud and clear, and now you, you know you're going down 10,000 times uh, faster down the luminosity function. We just want to let you know, this is a bit serious thing here. Okay, I'm gonna, I want to say something slightly serious, because it came up in Bernie's talk yesterday, and this is to India. <laughs> um, uh, India's getting now into big time, big science. TMT, LIGO, SKA, perhaps, you know, SKA obviously, yeah. Uh, and other things, LSST perhaps, you know, all these sort of things, that, you know. And the same sort of arguments that, are going, that have Bernie explained what the points were and very, very clearly last night. Now, India is not South Africa, and South Africa is not India, but Anybody who was there last night and listening would recognize, A, the importance of making this communication loud and clear in India, because people deserve that. Um, and, uh, of, um, and of important and thoughtful arguments for why it is important to get in, into this sort of activity. And I, I just leave it like that, okay. Uh, that we're ready for to go. I think that's sort of a lazy poet. Um, you, you can make a living deconstructing pop. Uh, it's like refereeing papers. Um, uh, out into the universe. I think that's, yeah, well that's, where, well, that's where it is now. Yes. We don't care who's been there first. So that's a comment on the altruism of observers. Um, uh, but also perhaps more... Um, uh, more usefully, um, the fact that the next telescope sees it better. Um, so that's a better way of thinking about it, yes. On a radio telescope, the preposition is a little confusing, but um, <laughs> there may, may be some slight confusion in the poet's mind. Um, science tells us that there's hope. Um, uh, oh, no, I didn't want to say that. Science tells us that there's hope. And this is the second serious point. Um, and then again, this was made um, yesterday, not by Bernie, but um, 
in cultures where uh, uh, superstition and ignorance are rife, like the India, and I have to say the United States, um, the, it is important, not just as a sort of intellectual arrogance, but for survival, that science is seen as a solution to problems, not an opinion. And that's terribly important. And astronomy is a very visible science, and it's terribly important to remember that message when we try and get it. And then the final thing is life on pl other planets might exist. And what actually triggered this was reading in my electronic newspaper that it's now claimed there's a Dyson sphere around a protoplanetary disk. Um, this is remarkable on many fronts, um, not the least the existence of a Dyson sphere, whatever that it may be, that conforms with Newton's laws of motion. Um, but uh, anyway, I have to give the, yeah, the reference. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank, thank you uh, for your hospitality. Thanks, ICTS. Sorry for going too long. And to Prehi Namaste.